Okay, um, first of all, um, I should say uh, thank you very much for the project that this is all about, for having to sponsor me to come here and tell you a little bit about it. Um, so this is really some preliminary results, some very preliminary results, about a piece of work that I'm involved with, a whole range of other people, as you can see um, from the slide there, about trying to understand about river restoration and riparian restoration, and whether that can help in terms of resilience to contaminated sediment. So this, the little bit I'm going to talk about at the end of this is all to do with a project called Blue Green Cities. Um, and the ethos of that Blue Green Cities project. Um, so the Blue Green Cities project is, is built of a team of people from across the UK, and if you want to know more about it, then please feel free to go to that website there, bluegreencities.ac.uk. Um, it's a whole range of universities across the UK, and we've come together with different backgrounds and different interests in terms of how you might deliver blue and green cities, primarily for flood risk management. <coughs> But the aim of the um, uh, Blue Green Cities research is really to develop and um, evaluate strategies for managing flood risk management, but it also needs to consider the multiple benefits. So it's part of those multiple benefits for urban planning and re renewal. So it's a whole range of aspirations that the project is trying to address. So in terms of uh, that blue and green side of the cycle, what we're trying to understand is um, the urban cycle, how that works, where the infiltration uh, issues are, where the groundwater and that relationship with the, with the river, um, understanding what happens in terms of the streets that you have there, and then trying to think about where, in terms of incorporating more natural blue elements, i.e. restoration, and also green elements to that um, landscape, can help in terms of not only flood risk management, but also in terms of reducing the contamination that may get into your oh. rivers. It doesn't only look at the physical elements, it's not something I'm talking about today, but it's important in the context of the um, project itself. It also looks to understand how people integrate people's perceptions of those blue and green elements of a, of a city. And it also tries to put some values on the wider <coughs> ecosystem services elements um, of, of the blue and the green and try and understand how that um, uh, fits um, and how, how the differences between uh, blue and green structure compared to more traditional, um, uh, uh, um, what's the word I'm trying to think, uh, more traditional um, uh, ways of dealing with um, flood risk management. So we're really trying to incorporate and look at all of these various elements. So getting away from the hard engineering element, but thinking about green roofs, permeable flay, um, paving, um, wetlands, washland, balancing ponds, and also the natural floodplain um, area and river restoration at the end, all as part of that whole suite of what you might be able to do. So part of that project is the one um, that I want to give you a little bit of information about, um, and that's called the Clean Water for All project. When this initiative for Blue Green City started, um, some of you may have heard of Portland, Oregon, as being one of the flagships for trying to look at blue green cities. Um, and so um, we, we have a lot of um, relationship between the organizations that are working there, both the university and um, the, the state there, to try and understand what they've put into operation and also to try and understand the issues that they've overcome and the problems and the difficulties that they're still tackling in terms of flood risk management and also um, urban contamination as well within the rivers and the floodplain. So we went out to Portland um, because there are a lot of restoration projects 
um, within the whole catchment. The catchment is quite urban, um, but there are restored sections. There's very heavily urbanised sections, heavily modified sections. And there's also, particularly in the upper, upper reaches and in some of the tributaries, there's more natural sections. So there's a real good opportunity to try and look to see what we could find out to test some ideas. And um, the idea is that then what we do, that what we did there for a couple of weeks, we could then bring back and we'll be um, trying to have a case study um, in the UK with Newcastle being the, um, the city that's, that's chosen to try and understand how you can retrofit um, these, these kind of elements um, within, a, within a city. So the Johnson Creek itself, which was the area that we looked at, is um, in Portland um, and the Gresham area next, a uh, bit further upstream. It's about 40 kilometres in length. Um, and then it flows into the Willamette River um, and then out to the Pacific Ocean. Um, originally, this, this whole river is really, really important because it supports the Chinook um, salmon and therefore there was a real important and aspiration to improve it for uh, water quality and that was really where this whole idea of improving the whole area and retrofitting urban drainage, trying to restore the rivers, trying to restore the floodplain area um, elements came within, within that system. Um, but there was also a flood risk management issue as well so it's a combination of those two things. So in terms of this little bit of work that we were doing, one of the questions we really wanted to pose um, with our, our small part of a whole wider bit of research was looking at all the other elements, was can river restoration provide a benefit in terms of reducing contaminated sediment? We had a couple of aims. Um, that was, those were to identify the effect of river and riparian restoration on contamination levels. And we used, obviously, the Johnson Creek as a case study. And then we analysed the influence of the stormwater outfalls. So we looked at a range of outfalls and we looked at the contaminant heavy metal concentrations. Um, there was a whole range of um, analysis, but first of all, um, as, a, as a starting point, we looked at the iron, the lead and the zinc um, because those were the metals that we expected would be most likely coming from those surface outfalls, from the roads around the area um, and into the rivers. So we had a sampling strategy. It looks a little patchy, but believe you me, it was unbelievably difficult to find a range of sites that had different modifications, different land uses, and different habitats that we could actually get into the river without killing ourselves en route, um, and obviously taking that into consideration as well. But also trying to find areas where there were outfalls and we could actually get to those outfalls as well. But we managed to do it. We had about 25 um, sites um, across the whole of the, um, whole of the Johnson Creek. And they contributed to that whole range of mix of different types of um, uh, elements of modification throughout the whole, whole reach. So we collected samples at each of the outfall. And we also looked at um, what the sediment was upstream and downstream of each of those outfalls. And to try and get some idea of what each of those sections were like, we also used what's called River Habitat Survey, which is used quite widely in the UK to try and identify the modification and also the uh, quality of each of those elements. We had to modify it because normally you would do it over a 500 metre reach, um, but we still were able to use that information to get some modification scores and habitat scores so that we could then identify and compare the different reaches for the different types of um, sediment that was in there and see if we could get any idea about whether the river restoration projects were having any um, benefit in terms of how they dealt with the contamination. So we collected a load of samples and then we filtered them. The only reason I put this in here really was because it's the afternoon and um, it's that time when people like to go to sleep. So there's a little story attached to this. Um, that piece of red cloth that you see there, we realised we needed to make up a filtration um, system of some sort and good fieldwork style. We went into the local um, dressmaker's shop 
um, very, very nicely well-heeled ladies in there, and we uh, identified pieces of red, well, not red material, piece of material that were the right size in terms of um, obviously filtering sediments. Um, and uh, we went in looking like that um, with our yellow jackets and waders on, and I just think they thought we were completely completely balmy um, but they work to treat so um, if you need to make a filtration um, a piece of cloth like that that works very well so in terms of the types of restoration when they do river restoration projects in the northwest they talk big um, this was taken off one of the um, information boards which is why it says you are here there even though you're not um, but they are very very large restoration um, schemes they're one two three kilometers um, in length um, and um, they, they they do a lot of lot of work within those there's about five or six restoration schemes on that one river so we looked at two or three of them and they have um, a habit of using a very similar technique along a lot of those restored reaches. They re-meander them, but they also put in and hold in a lot of large wood to try and create some habitat and to try and hold back some sediment. But you may notice in there, there's a little red blob up there, at the top there, um, and within these restoration sites, there are outfalls. Some of them come straight into the river like that, but quite a lot of them in the restored sections are set back, as is this one. So it's set right back away from the river. Um, and so one of the things we were doing was trying to look to see whether there was any difference between setback outfalls and those that went straight into the river and what the implications might be. Um, and that's just that outfall from the, from the other other site but please keep a note on that in terms of how much fine sediment there is actually within this river system within the restored reach given that the Johnson Creek is actually um, naturally a chalk stream fed river but those are the restored sections there are also within that mix some very heavily modified sections such as this and there are as I say some natural sections as well so this is just um, to give you an idea of some of the things that we looked at in terms of the RHS. I haven't got the whole thing here. If you uh, Google um, River Habitat Survey, you can find out exactly the sorts of things that are included. But the idea is, is you collect a whole load of information um, and then you can work out some scoring system that allows you to identify what you think relative to other sites within that catchment are, um, the, what the habitat is like and how modified the scoring system is as well. And we were very interested in the modification side of things. Um, and then we put together some scoring systems like this. And here you can see there's the habitat um, and the modification scores, and we tried to look at those and tried to get some idea about um, what was happening in terms of how the outfalls were, were operating. So, what did we find? Well, these are very, very, very preliminary um, out um, um, sort of information that came from the, uh, the, the the project so far. There's an awful lot more to come, and this is really, really, as I say, just just starters for ten. Um, looking at um, the uh, the three um, uh, elements that I was talking about before, so we looked at uh, one thing. We looked at was the percentage difference of the iron, the concentration between where the outfall was and downstream. <laughs> And we looked at them in terms of those um, outfalls that came directly into the river and the ones that are the setback, as, setback ones as well. Um, and you can see here there's a percentage difference between each of those. It's not massively significant in terms of um, the, the difference between those two. And the similar sort of um, pattern as well in terms of the lead. And there's quite a lot of variability um, within those results. When you look at the sink as well, it's even more complicated in terms of the pattern, um, in terms of the different types of outfalls, whether they were directly coming into the river system or whether they were setbacks as well. 
Um, and here it was looking as if there was actually an increase um, in, this, in the um, contamination as you went downstream away from the outfall, which was certainly not what we were expecting at all. And this is just the mean for each of those. There's a lot more information to come yet. Um, but what we did also observe when we were there was there was a lot of fine, fine sediment that was actually accumulating in each of the restoration sites. So at the moment, it's early days, but we've, we noticed that not all the heavy metals responded um, the same to the setbacks. Um, and there, there is a change, um, quite a chain, change between the setback outfalls in the context of the iron and also for the lead. But really the same doesn't hold true for the, um, the zinc. So we don't know whether there's another source that's, that's causing that, that variability. So we really need to understand a lot more about the transfer of the metals within the river system. So finally, in terms of the early indications and perhaps the next steps, um, we, we recognise that not all the heavy metals um, are reacting the same way and it's going to be difficult to tease out those trends. We have a lot of other information, but unfortunately we're still going through the process of collecting that and, and, and we're analysing it. Um, but I think what we did notice and what we noticed from being out on site as well um, and looking at the modification scores and the habitat scores um, was that the type of river restoration techniques may have a significant impact on how they um, react in terms of um, dealing with the sediments. Um, and the river restoration projects need to be completed certainly within conjunction with the setback outfalls and certainly looking at the whole range of the data, that seems to be something that um, is really beneficial um, um, within the contamination side of things. Um, and in terms of the, the, the Johnson Creek, I think it's possible that the contamination is actually being stored because they are acting as sediment sinks um, within those restoration sites. Um, and I think that's the way that they've actually been designed. Um, but what we don't know at the moment, and we um, also collected information about the micro microbial activity within each of those sections as well. Um, and we need to find out whether that is having an impact in terms of how that is actually dealing with the, um, the contamination within the, within the river systems because there's a lot of nutrients um, and a lot of vegetation within those restoration sites. Um, and we obviously don't know at the moment how the sequencing um, of, of the flood events is affecting that contamination either. So we have still some more information that will be coming out over the next year in terms of what we found for this particular um, project. And then the plan is then to try and identify which elements of that sort of test site um, worked really well um, and then try and replicate it back in the UK using the Newcastle um, city centre um, and the Usburn as, as another site to compare and see what happens there and some of the restoration sites um, and the um, um, surrounding areas of riparian restoration that's um, occurred there. Hello, um, I have a small example of a small river in Vienna in, in the urban area. Uh, it's called the Petersbach and uh, there were construction works done um, some years ago and uh, two years ago. Uh, yeah, it's just a small example. Um, I'll tell you something about the project area, the construction works that are done and uh, we did a monitoring. Uh, we st started last year, so um, yeah, this is the River, it's the uh, river, the Petersbach. It's uh, in the urban area of Vienna, so we are here now in the Techgate, and it's in the south, um, and it's a very short river. It's just 16 kilometers uh, with an 11 square meter catchment, and uh, we have two areas uh, where we did construction works. Uh, one area uh, was done 2001 to 2002. And a second area was done uh, 2012, so two years ago. Um, it was a very um, interdisciplinary project. Um, the government was, uh, was in, the different planning um, companies, and we as university with our students um, uh, did the planning and uh, helped with the, with the um, construction works. Um, the area in between um, is a very um, 
closed area, so there is one area with a tunnel. And the second area is, uh, like the other two areas before, a very um, geometrical and uh, paved um, river stretch. So our objectives were um, to um, yeah, bring back the riparian vegetation and uh, morphology, the different types, uh, and the flow. And, but the flo uh, flood protection <coughs> should stay, of course. Uh, and uh, we want to introduce habitats for animals and plants. And as well, a very important point was the recreation, as it's in a, in a living area. Uh, with a lot of uh, family houses, so uh, big potential for recreation. Um, yes, the technique we used uh, was the soil bioengineering. Um, so there we work with dead materials, living plants, and auxiliary materials like geotextiles. Um, and we use it at slope and gullies um, above the timber line for uh, erosion protect, uh, protection and, of course, in river and riparian areas. Uh, at the lowest um, photo, you see the, the river Wien. That was uh, the construction site last year, as well done with soil bioengineering. Um, here the first area. So, of course, we had a little bit of uh, vegetation, but uh, the river is paved, and as you see, it's not so much water in, so uh, the vegetation and, uh, cannot interact with the, with the river. Um, the red line is here the, the existing geometry before the construction works. And uh, the picture shows the, the plant. Um, yeah, the plant one. Um, here in 2001, uh, the construction works started. Um, uh, first, the uh, pavement was um, pulled out. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and we did uh, stabilization uh, and uh, works, uh, like here, the fashion wall. Uh, it stabilizes the, the slope and structures uh, that have no stability function, but are just for, uh, for animals, fish, and uh, bentos to give, give them uh, living areas. Um, yeah, this is the, the um, area finished, um, 2001. Um, here you see some... Um, plants, already grown plants. Uh, this is 2002, uh, one year after the construction works. Uh, you see st still the, the, mea uh, the meandering um, flow, and um, these ones are here the groins again, and on the right one down is the fascine wall. Yes, and that's how it looked the last year, so it's a quite dense, uh, dense vegetation. Uh, you still see um, some uh, some of the structures. Uh, this is in in spring. Yeah, and from above you see it's a yeah, quite dense riparian vegetation. Um, and next to it there is a, a, a pathway and cycleway, so it's uh, quite well used by the uh, um, inhabitants. Um, this is the second area, done 2011-2012. So here you see the straight um, river, uh, still um, too paved as the upper one. And here, 2012, how it is um, after revitalization. So here you see the construction works. Um, yeah, we did a lot of different uh, soil bioengineering uh, soil bioengineering techniques. Um, you see the dormant cuttings, um, small ones, uh, a lot of uh, groins, different uh, tree spore groins or rock stock groins. Um, here again a machine wall for stabilization because there is the pathway next to it. And uh, on the areas where the, where the uh, slope is very small, we have the living bush matrices. Um, for structures, we did a lot of uh, rootstocks, and yeah, here you see the work um, with the students. So the students have the possibility to work with us in in, in framework of a lecture um, at this uh, construction site and uh, do the soil bioengineering uh, works. Before that, the 
um, companies build the earthworks and uh, the big structures. Um, yes, here's a more um, for the most uh, the most uh, st stale um, structures here. The living brush mattress. This we used um, on very uh, exposed um, areas. Yes, and here is this area one year after the construction. We see first growing vegetation. Uh, and this was this year, two years after construction. Um, last year and this year we did some monitoring uh, concerning vegetation and structures, um, concerning water temperature and vegetation cover. Um, so this is area one. Uh, there we have a very natural uh, riparian area with uh, willows, um, poplars, or, um, and uh, very mixed. Uh, we had trees, we had shrubs, so it's a very mixed um, composition. Whereas uh, in the lower part, in the area two, we have uh, now just willows, uh, um, different ones. Um, now uh, all, shru uh, all shrubs, but there are some uh, tree willows in as well that will grow, and um, some, cr some reeds. Um, when we look at this, we see that uh, the area one, it's the um, line, um, the height is, is very, very high, so they are already grown, but there are not so many individuals. So that's still, uh, and the uh, area two has a lot of individuals, so very high individual um, and very low, uh, sorry, different, very uh, low um, height, but very high individual dens uh, density. Um, so the, this um, gives us the global side factor. Um, it's a factor that shows us the uh, radiation above uh, and the radiation below the vegetation. Um, so on the left diagram you see um, the global side factor. When, it, when the side factor is low, the cover is very high. So here you see area one has a very low global side factor, so a lot of uh, radiation um, can be um, hold away by the plants. Um, and here you see the area two the plants are, are not uh, so high now, and so the sun goes directly into the water. Um, this results in the water temperature. That's a very important point for small um, rivers. There can be um, high differences in temperature uh, between shaded and unshaded areas, and uh, this results if there can live different, um, different animals. Um, so you see the light blue and the dark blue are area one, and the light green and the dark green are area two. And you see um, area two is uh, at yeah, around uh, 22 to 26 uh, degrees water temperature. Um, in an area, in a an, um, fast phase where uh, we had a, a very high air temperature, that's the red line, oops, sorry. Um, this was the area where we had the temperature records in, in Austria with um, uh, up to 40 degrees. Um, and you see that um, still the, the temperature stays uh, the same uh, when, there is a, when there is a shaded um, area. So the blue lines um, are really this, uh, nearly the same. Um, and they even um, lower us a little bit because the area the f uh, before that is a very unshaded one, uh, still in the paved bed. Uh, and down there, you see there are quite different temperatures. So the light, um, yellow, uh, light green one is still with 22, 26 degrees, and we have um, six degrees higher at the end point of this area. So in around 200 meters, this temperature, temperature can change uh, that much. And we can imagine that it's not the best for um, yeah, living in there. Um, yeah. Here you see the uh, heating uh, per, per meter, um, or the heating or decrease in temperature. So you see here in the, in the, where the global side factor is very low, so a lot of shade, 
it goes down. Then we have the area in between with the tunnel. There it goes up. That's the uh, investigation of this year. What's the, what is happening there? Is there an influence of the tunnel? Is the heat going through the asphalt? Um, and then here, the main increase in the second area. Yes, and uh, we even can see that in, in, in the water and the algae. Um, so we have the upper area with uh, few or no algae, and the unshaded area, we have a lot of algae. So in the beginning of the year, you see a lot of children playing there in the water, but as it's getting hotter and hotter, they don't like to go in there. Yes, yeah, so thank you for the attention. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about um, a project that we've worked um, with the Ribble Rivers Trust on um, for the past sort of two to three years. Um, so just to acknowledge other contributors, um, there's Jack Spees who managed the project um, at the Ribble Trust. Um, George Heritage, formerly of JBA, he is in the room somewhere. You can uh, any difficult questions at the end, he'll he'll pick them up. And uh, Matt Hemsworth as well, also of uh, of JBA Consulting. So I'm just going to um, introduce the Ribble catchment um, and the two tributaries that we looked at um, in Burnley that uh, join join the Ribble and the River Calder, Rivers Calder and Brun. Um, I'm then going to run through how we developed. Um, solutions to improve the ecological and geomorphological condition um, of this sort of highly modified, highly constrained um, channel through Burnley. Um, how we went from sort of development of a, a concept, so an, an unconstrained vision, and then as we went through the development process, how that became sort of a, a realistic and constrained plan. Um, and then just prevent some, uh, present some conclusions, um, maybe for some discussion at the end. So the, the Ribble itself, um, it's probably most famous for a few things, including the, the Ribble uh, Head Viaduct, uh, Stainforth Foss, Long Preston Deeps, um, which is being pre presented on um, tomorrow, and the, the Ribble Valley. <coughs> so we've got the, the viaduct in the top right, uh, Stainforth Foss, bottom right, and this is the Ribble Valley here, and that's part of the Long, Long Preston Deeps at the top. But it also has its not so pretty areas, um, particularly the Calder, Calder and Darwin urban valleys. Um, so, and we're looking at the, the Calder section of this. <clears throat> so, just to uh, show you where we are in England, so we're in the northwest of England, um, up towards Yorkshire. Um, so the Ribble itself um, originates at Ribble Head, um, flows sort of southwesterly um, towards Preston, and where we are working is on the, the rivers Calder and Brun in Burnley. Um, so the, the Ribble catchment itself is about 900 square miles, so a decent sized catchment, and the Ribble is about 80 miles long, um, and there's about one and a quarter million people within this catchment. So there's a lot of social and stakeholder interest in what was going on here, which was an important part of the, uh, the development process when we were bringing that unconstrained plan to a sort of realistic plan. So this is the uh, beautiful Calder um, running through Burnley. Um, as you can see, highly modified, um, lots of brick lining, lots of culverts, lots of infrastructure, um, very little habitat diversity, very little geomorphological diversity, um, and we have built right up to the bank edge in many places. I wouldn't want to own one of these properties in a flood. Um, so that's just to give you a taste of the, the sort of river that we're dealing with here. But highly energetic, lots of gravel coming into this system, um, but it just doesn't have chance to deposit because of the, the flume that has been created here with this brick lining. So as part of the, um, so that the urban river enhancements came about as a result of um, 
prior projects on the Calder to improve fish passage. Um, and they, so we, we undertook alongside the Ribble Trust a, a general sort of catchment walkover to identify the next phase, which turned out to be um, concentration in Burnley for this urban river enhancement scheme. Um, as I've sort of already shown, that the walkovers discovered some really quite poor habitat and significant mistreatment and modification of the river over many years. Um, very little gravel, it's very fast flowing, it's very steep. Um, there's a lot of pollution, a lot of misconnections in the, uh, the sewer network. Very poor habitat as a result, <coughs> um, unless you count these nice wooden crates down at the bottom here. But there are fish there. Um, you can just about make those out. Um, so they do live there, surprisingly, um, but they can't go very far. Um, as a result of all the, the modification that has taken place. So there's potential. Um, so as a result of those walkovers, we identified sort of the physical and process-based problems, um, and the Ribble Trust did a lot of work um, with stakeholders in the community um, from that, that side of things. So we were gradually bringing everything together, um, and as a result of bringing that information together, the, the trusts were successful in a heritage lottery fund to sort of take it to the next, the next sort of scoping phase. <clears throat> um, so they worked with, worked with us to get to that stage. Um, and it, it was surprising when we undertook these walkovers how much interest there was in a very modified and quite ugly river. It was surprising how many locals stopped to talk to us. It is fished, and they do catch quite a lot of fish. Um, but probably the same fish over and over again from the same pool because they can't move anywhere. So after that we developed um, sort of a list of criteria so that we could go and intervene in this modified system to make improvements. Um, and the first three at the top of the list for the regulators were not to increase flood risk. Um, Unsurprisingly, it's a very sensitive subject in Burnley, um, and it is quite sensitive to change. Um, so that was very much at the top of the list. Lots of structures um, that are, you know, road bridges, road culverts. Um, so we had to maintain that stability with whatever we were proposing. However, we, we needed to reduce water velocities to both improve the ecological habitat and the geomorphological conditions so we could actually let some of this gravel deposit bearing in mind what that could do um, to the flood water levels. Um, when we also use criteria, um, so this is um, velocities out of the EA, the Environment Agency Fish Pass Manual, um, you know, and under sort of normal flow conditions, we're at sort of 2, 2.5 metres per second um, within the calder. So as you can see, already quite a significant barrier to, to fish movement and certainly preventing a lot of gravel depositing. We wanted to improve flow and habitat heterogeneity as, as a result of whatever we decided to do. And these were some initial sketches that the sort of trust came to us with initially. Um, and as you can see, they really wanted to try and use as many natural type options to improve the diversity wherever possible. Um, but just keep those sketches in your head for some photographs later for, for what we actually ended up with. But, you know, so we set out with intentions to, to use less engineered, in engineered approach approaches wherever we could. So we wanted some sediment to drop out. So we identified some sort of uh, 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 some methods to um, sort of flesh out some ideas of what we wanted to do. Um, so we did... Um, a walkover, so a hydromorphological fluvial audit, field audit. Um, so we walked a lot of the catchment um, to identify sediment sources, where it's coming from, whether there was a good supply to the reaches that we were going to um, restore. And as you can see, there was, which was good. So we knew that if we gave it the correct form within Burnley, that there would be plenty of gravel coming through to deposit out. So hopefully it should be sustainable in that respect. We also did um, some initial modelling, um, mainly because we had to demonstrate what the impacts would be on flood risk. So we initially started with a, a 1D, um, 1D in-channel model and 2D floodplain model that were linked 
um, which, which was the environment agency model of um, the River Calder and Brun. Um, so we used that to uh, model some of the initial concepts to see what impact that had on floodwater levels, accounting for any potential sediment deposition as a result. As plans went on, we, we gathered more and more survey information and, pro and we had enough to develop um, a better two-dimensional hydraulic model um, through the study reaches, um, which gave us much better information on um, velocities and shear stresses, which we could use to infer impacts on habitat and uh, sediment <coughs> transport. And it also gives you a lot better data in terms of um, visual impacts that we could use to um, inform stakeholders and regulators to show you what the changes would be. <clears throat> we, for sort of design purposes, we split up the uh, reaches. I've just noticed the mistake. I've said 13 reaches. There is actually 12. So, uh, first mistake. Um, so there was 10 on the cold and 2 on the brun. But as you can see, the sort of concentrate. The, they're split between the, the main sort of structures, so we've got open, open sections between various culverts. But we had to model each reach together. We couldn't model them in, in, in separation, you know, appreciating continuity that what we do in one area is going to impact somewhere else, so we had to consider it all as one. The options that we... Um, looked at them, were then modelled, so we built the base model and then modelled the options to see what the impacts were on the hydraulics and then inferred that to the potential sediment regime and habitats that could be created. So you know, the, the, drawing, the design drawings were starting to take a little bit more detail um, in terms of potential sizing um, and identified where we could from analogue features um, elsewhere in the catchment as well as um, the model information. So firstly, we had to demonstrate the impacts on flood risk, but second to that, we, we took out the hydraulic information um, to infer impacts on habitat and sediment deposition. Um, so we, we, you know, we had these constant gradient sections where we were putting in sort of riffle type features to see what the impact would be on water levels and on uh, hydraulic habitat and hydraulics and sediment transport. Um, we also modelled some of the, the, the features in, in, in 2D <clears throat> um, to get the velocity information. Um, and again, you know, very, the visuals were, were very powerful in demonstrating the changes to the regulators. Um, and we could use that hydraulic information to link to thresholds for sediment transport so we could then sort of say where, it, where sediment is going to deposit, where it's still going to be transported, that, that type of information. So we did all this modelling work and we went back to the regulators um, as a result of saying that, you know, we're going to, we want to achieve some sediment deposition. There was concerns about impacts on flood risk. Um, and the modelling showed some very minor um, increases, but even a few millimetres wasn't acceptable. Um, and we actually, there were some Im improvements in flood risk in some areas, but despite uh, the, the balance between the two, meaning we were actually probably improving it, even as the very small areas where there was increase couldn't, couldn't be accepted. Um, <clears throat> so what we did, we did some more assessment work on the, on the flow regime linked to the potential for sediment transport using that hydraulic information that we had. <clears throat> um, so we wanted sediment to, to gather where we, where we could and deposit where where we wanted it to from a habitat and a geomorphological um, improvement perspective. But <clears throat> um, the regulators didn't want that sediment there during flood conditions um, because of the sensitivity of the river to um, any uh, increase in uh, bed levels within the channel. So we had to design the features around um, the flood regime ensuring that if there was um, a risk of out-of-bank flow, <coughs> that those flows that were generated meant that that sediment was transported so that the capacity was maintained during the flood conditions. So again, working with the constraint of flood risk, it was a, a compromise that we had to come to. <coughs> it obviously had ecological um, 
negative aspects associated to that, but it's a compromise we had to make. And we, we used um, the Schulstrom curve to link the, the velocity information to um, potential for <coughs> deposition and transport. So after all of that, we, we finally came up with some final options. Um, and this is some of the flood, info, uh, flood mapping that I, what I spoke about. So you can see we were only showing very small um, increases in some areas that weren't actually <coughs> impacting any property. Um, and we were actually benefiting a, a few other areas downstream. But um, And our argument was that the incre increases were beyond the accuracy of the model. Um, but we still had to work within that uh, within that want from the environment agency. We then went to the detailed design <coughs> with the contractors, <coughs> and the practicality of it soon hit home. Um, access was a huge issue. It was um, very inaccessible in a lot of places due to the steepness and the walling around the river, so that impacted on the project cost. <coughs> services, um, it's like a service highway underneath the river and underneath the, the line bed, there's pipes everywhere, um, which only came to light as we start, you know, that we had service um, plans, but as we dug up the channel, more and more pipes appeared, um, so they, you know, there were last minute changes to the design. Health and safety, <coughs> it's a very flashy catchment, water levels change very quickly, um, so they had to bear that in mind when working on site, ensuring there was adequate flood warning. Lots of pollution, you know, not only what was existing, but what also could be generated and transported downstream during the construction. So that all had to be um, taken account of by the, contractors, by the contractors who were pricing up the design and build. And as a result of that, to deliver all of those um, 12, air, 12 reaches, um, the price was about 1.4 million, which was more money than the trust had. These were just the, the type of um, design drawings. So you get, again, we're building in more and more detail. So we had to go back um, and select some priority areas um, using all the information that we've gathered before. Um, and also working with local people, local knowledge and, you know, where the public wanted to see improvements where they had, a, had a good access to the river. Um, so we worked with the hydraulic information, the velocity information to see where we could um, reduce this significantly and you know, Im improve the habitat um, and get some gravel depositing out during some of the flows. We also used some fish data um, that was gathered by the Ribble Trust, so linked it to that. Five locations were then selected as a result of that. <clears throat> we then had to go back and model just those five reaches um, to sort of satisfy the environment agency what the impacts would be in terms of flood risk. Luckily, we had similar outputs. Um, we managed to demonstrate no um, significant impacts in flood levels, and we eventually got some consent provided. Then to the actual construction, um, the temporary works had to be refined um, throughout when they were on site, mainly because of the discovery of unknown services under the, under the brick line channel. Um, so I've got some shots here before and after. So this was the, the straightened, one of the straightened sections that we looked at. <coughs> um, so on the, on the right hand side there, they're working on the, uh, the bypass channel so they could do the works within the main channel. So this is uh, the bypass channel as it's being created. <clears throat> so this is when they diverted the flow into the um, bypass channel so they could do the works in the main channel. These were the ty types of pipes that were appearing everywhere. Some were meant to be redundant uh, but had water running through them. Um, so ones that were identified for removal couldn't, couldn't be. Um, And this is what we ended up with. Now, if you remember back to the sketches that we had, um, it's quite a difference. Um, it's mainly because we couldn't put any features in that um, of a large size that could potentially be mobile during a flood, um, <clears throat> mainly because of uh, 
constraint associated blockage within the, within the culverts. Um, but I think you can see there that we're actually getting some hydraulic diversity as a result of the widening and the bed features that were put in. Um, probably not as much as we anticipated and wanted at the start, but it's better than what it was before. So some sort of conclusions. We eventually developed uh, a process of development and design with lo lots of turn and frame with the regulators, <clears throat> and there's a lot of um, lessons learned as a result, particularly um, with the construction techniques. I mean, they spent a lot, of, a lot more time breaking out the brick lining because they couldn't get the necessary machinery in the channel to do it properly or more efficiently. <clears throat> we did increase habitat, habitat and flow heterogeneity, um, but not, probably not as much as we wanted to. We did reduce water velocities. We did demonstrate that we maintained flood risk and reduced it in some areas. We demonstrated that we'd maintained structural stability. And we did demonstrate that we were managing the sediment. So this was after a, a decent flow afterwards. So there was some sediment that was dropped out. And um, the, guy, the guys at the trust went back out during a flood and just after the flood and it had, it had moved. Um, so the, the sort of flow regime assessment that we did was, was effective. So that, that pleased the regulators. Um, Importantly, we change local perceptions. Um, you know, that we can deliver improvements, albeit through a very artificial way, um, to improve sort of geomorphic and ecological habitat to a degree. And the council um, were pleased with it, and it, you know, further stages are now built into their core plan and their green infrastructure strategy. Um, so going forward, um, any any proposed development works need to build in building the proposals and the design as it stands for the rest of the reaches. So that was a, a good outcome for the trust in particular. Um, and uh, the cost for delivering, so the, the five priority reaches were selected. Um, two were actually delivered in the end for a cost of 300,000 um, for quite short reaches. So it is a lot of money. And that's about it. I did write down three sort of key points to sort of take away and think about was how we um, deliver urban restoration in this highly constrained environment, bearing in mind the costs involved. Um, how do we manage and balance the needs in terms of flood risk with eco ecological gain, environmental gain? And Hopefully, it's demonstrated that we can use a bit of science to demonstrate um, geomorphological and ecological improvement to persuade regulators that what we're doing is actually improving things to a degree. Um, so I'll leave it there. Late, late in the evening. Now I think we can start. Uh, I can introduce Mark Piersis. He's uh, an environmental consultant at Royal Hess DHV. I hope I said it right, based in London. He has been with the company for eight years. He has worked on a number of river restoration projects throughout the UK and enjoys seeing the projects through all stages of development. Me too. From inception through design and ultimately construction. As a project manager, he enjoys the challenge of bringing together specialists from a wide range of backgrounds to achieve a common goal. Thank you, Thank you Chair. So uh, apologies, we've got another UK-based project. Um, we're obviously quite keen to get to our quota, quota before those 600 years. Um, so my presentation today is on the Wandle Park uh, restoration project, and it's really a story about a river that was creating a problem in terms of flood risk and water quality and was actually um, neglected and forgotten for over 40 years. It was actually culverted. And this is a story about how that river was has changed from being a problem into really being a focal point for uh, regeneration within a park space. So in terms of the content of my presentation, um, over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to the project. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of the park. Um, I'm going to talk through some of the challenges that um, I and the project team have experienced in terms of restoring rivers in, uh, re restore, restoring rivers in urban environments, talk you through some of the solutions and approaches we took on this project, some of the lessons learned, and I've got some nice pictures of the finished scheme to, uh, to wrap up and conclude with. 
So just a little bit about the um, Wandle Park's location. Um, as the name suggests, Wandle Park is located on the River Wandle, um, which is in South London. Uh, it's actually a tributary of the River Thames, um, and it's a chalk stream that arises um, down in Croydon towards the bottom right-hand side of the screen and flows around 14 kilometres up through uh, Merton uh, into Wandsworth into the Thames. Um, it's got a because it's quite a steep river. It's um, got a history of being a sort of a quite heavily working river. It's, it was heavily industrialised during the 17th and 18th centuries, um, mainly associated to the tobacco and textile industries. Um, during the Victorian era, there were uh, over 90 mills on the river, um, some of which uh, still remain. The river's been heavily impacted by industry and urbanisation, um, like many of the rivers in in London. Uh, and it was actually declared an open sewer uh, in the 1960s. Um, more recently, there was quite a severe um, pollution event um, on the river. Uh, a water company accidentally released large volumes of chlorine into the river, killing uh, the fish population. Um, but the river is starting to improve, um, thanks in, in large part due to the, the work of the Wandle Trust, who, uh, one of the rivers trusts in the UK, who are doing a lot of good work on the river, uh, removing weirs. Um, doing things like channel, channel narrowing, etc. So the work that I've been involved with at Wandle Park um, forms um, a small part of a much wider uh, initiative to uh, improve the River Wandle in general. So a bit about the history of um, Wandle Park. It's one of the oldest uh, open spaces in Croydon and, and South London. Um, like many of the parks in, in London, it was um, created um, during the Industrial Revolution to recognise that people of London needed um, some open green space for recreation and, and well-being. Uh, it was actually opened back in 1890 by the Mayor of Croydon and attracted over 30,000 people. Um, it's a picture of the original layout of the park uh, in the north uh, top, uh, top slide there. Um, one of the main attractions of the park was an old Victorian um, boating lake um, that featured in a postcard of the time. It's the bottom picture there. Um, there's actually quite a nice uh, quote from a local paper that reported uh, that the opening proceedings were enlivened by personages swimming in the lake that should have known better. Um, I imagine that was quite a, quite a nice thing to be there on that day that it was opened. Um, and the lake really continued to be quite popular with the local community um, through to the turn of the century. Um, but the park has suffered um, results of impacts of urbanisation um, during the 1930s. Um, the water supply to the lake and the river began to uh, fluctuate and the water table began to drop. Um, the park has been impacted quite badly by the urbanisation of um, Croydon and the surrounding area, as you can see by the, the top picture there. It's surrounded by uh, industry and um, residential areas now. Um, and the river became a bit of a problem. Um, it uh, had poor water quality and it was quite flashy in terms of um, flood risk. So. Uh, as was typical of the time in the 1960s, rather than sort of solving the problem, um, the river was basically culverted uh, in a box culvert buried three metres uh, below ground level. Um, the old river channel was infilled and the flow was um, diverted into this culvert. Um, so effectively for sort of 40 years the river's been lost to the local community. Um, the blue line on the uh, map there shows the old alignment of the river course and the red line shows the alignment of the new culvert. Um, when I was out um, in the park in 2010, I remember asking people using the park, do you know where your nearest river is? Many of them said, Thames, the River Thames. Very few of them were aware that there's actually a river flowing beneath their, beneath their feet, which is quite astounding, really. Um, the only evidence of the, the river uh, were two manhole covers uh, and uh, alignment of um, willow trees through the park that denoted the old uh, course of the river. Um, and with the, with the river being culverted, um, the park has experienced a sort of decline in, in park usage. Um, it's only really, it was only previously really used on a sort of Saturday morning for uh, five-a-side football, and it attracted some uh, antisocial behaviour, um, lots of underage kids uh, drinking alcohol in, on park benches and so on. Um, these are just some images of the um, park when I first went to see it back in 2010. So the manhole cover um, is the only real um, evidence of... of um, where the river uh, previously was. Um, there was talk of um, restoring the river for quite some time, um, but uh, in 2010, um, an, an initiative to restore the park um, really began to uh, gain momentum. 
um, by the Croydon Council and the Environment Agency. Um, and there was an agreed set of drivers for restoring the park. There was a real desire, um, both amongst the council and the EA, but as, as well from local people, to really improve the park, both, both for people and for, <coughs> for nature. So uh, a project team was um, pulled together, um, led really by Croydon, Canc Croydon Council, but very much in partnership with um, the Environment Agency and the Friends of Wandle Park. Um, we, as Hasconing, as designers, were brought on board to assist with um, the river restoration design elements and dealing with the contaminated land aspects. And we were working in partnership with um, LDA Design, who are a landscape uh, architect company. Um, funding for the scheme came from various sources. Um, obviously, as I've indicated in some of the slides previously, the park has got um, quite interesting history. So we were able to secure some money from the Heritage Lottery Fund. And the Mayor of London also ran a scheme to provide um, funding to parks in London um, where the public had a chance to vote for those parks that they wanted to see improved. And, and Wandle Park was one of those parks where the community really wanted to see a, an improvement to the park. Uh, and in total, we managed to obtain um, three and a half million or 4.5 million euros um, to take the scheme forward through to detailed design and construction. So um, a vision for the park was developed. Um, and this wasn't a vision that was put forward by landscape architects or, or consultants, it was very much a vision that was driven by the local community. Um, there are a range of um, stakeholder events in the park and in local community centres where um, the local community had a chance to influence the um, design of the, of the new scheme. And one of the key things that we were obviously keen to do was to daylight the river, um, bring it out of culvert and really have that as a kind of focal point for regeneration of the park. Uh, and as well, there was a, a desire to recreate some of the historic Victorian, uh, Victorian features within the park, including the um, lake that was previously infilled, uh, and some of the play facilities as well. So because this um, park fell within quite a highly constrained urban environment, there were a range of um, challenges that we faced both during um, design and during construction. I just wanted to talk through uh, our experiences in, in some of those areas. Um, firstly, in terms of contaminated land and materials movement. Obviously, I mentioned that the lake and the river were infilled largely with building rubble from the um, construction of Croydon Town Centre. So all sorts of nasties in there. Um, so that, create, that, created a, uh, that created a challenge. Um, there are obviously um, risks to human health if we're doing large amounts of uh, materials movement within a park, and that park is subsequently used by the public and children playing. There's a um, potential risk to human health there. Uh, and obviously we're dealing with large volumes of excavated material from the um, channel, uh, new channel uh, excavation and from the lake. So it's a case of what do we do with that material. So what we did is we did a very early um, ground investigation and quite a detailed um, ground investigation. Um, I know of quite a few schemes that have come unstuck because they didn't really necessarily appreciate or understand um, the volumes of contaminated material they were dealing with. Um, so that did actually work quite well. We had quite a good understanding of what uh, materials we were, um, we were dealing with. Um, we managed to align the uh, new river channel um, away from that area, that area that had the highest amount of contamination um, and we initiated um, early dialogue with the um, contaminated land officer at the local planning authority to agree what the remediation strategy would be. In this case, we were able to um, bury a lot of the contaminated material under a clean capping layer of, of clean material. Um, and we're also able to use a lot of the material that was generated in the sort of landscaping works that were being developed by our landscape architects. Um, and we were able to recycle some of the concrete from the, the culvert um, and crush that up and use it in some of the gabions that were used as part of the um, structures that were put on site. Um, and I think one of the key successes from this scheme is that we managed to um, get away without doing hardly any off-site soil disposal, um, which would have been both costly and obviously damaging in terms of traffic movements and, and carbon footprint. And we were very lucky um, in this uh, instance in that we had a very competent contractor that was very uh, environmentally aware and understood the complexities of um, moving materials on, on a re relatively small site. Um, this was touched on earlier by the previous presentation, but um, being in an urban environment, um, we again had lots of buried um, services. We had a high voltage electricity cable basically running through the site that we um, had to deal with. We had surface water sewers, and we had problems with lead in times of dealing with the um, statutory undertakers, inaccurate service plans, um, and we had also we also had several mature trees and root protection areas that we needed to work around. So quite a few buried constraints that we had to deal with 
um, during our design. To get around that, um, we initiated early dialogue with the service companies. We actually got them out on site and talked them through what we wanted to do, um, which we felt helped to move things along a lot quicker. Um, we undertook some quite detailed surveys. And we did a, what's called a ground penetrating radar survey to identify exactly where the um, electricity cables were to enable us to refine our design. Um, and in most cases, one of the easiest things we did was just to avoid those areas that we knew were sort of heavily congested with um, cables and so on. Um, one of the other challenges that we had um, was the hydraulic modelling. Um, I think one of the original assumptions that because we were taking a three metre wide uh, box culvert and putting that into a quite a large flood channel, a sort of um, 30 metre wide flood channel, that that would actually be improving the situation in terms of flood risk. Um, but because we had to put a trash screen uh, on the new channel as it went back into culvert, um, there was a requirement for us to demonstrate that if that um, trash screen was blocked um, during a flood event, um, that the park wouldn't flood. So there was a, some tricky modelling discussions that we had between our modellers and the environment agency. Um, so the way that we got around that um, was that we had to increase the um, channel capacity um, very slightly. Um, just in terms of some of the lessons learned, um, no scheme is perfect. Um, I think we were aware that the scheme, the final scheme, um, was likely to be subject to some vandalism. It's in quite an urban area. But I think we underestimated exactly how much damage could be done to our scheme. Um, during construction, we ended up with quite a lot of uh, theft and removal of security fencing. Um, after the scheme had been constructed, um, some of our uh, exposed coir was set alight by vandals. Um, even some of the homeless people using the park decided to use some of the core matting as, as bedding. <laughs> um, and we ended up with um, quite a few of our gabion baskets being picked apart by um, skateboarders using the area. Um, but despite um, a number of challenges on this um, project, I think what we delivered in the end was successful. Um, the park was opened in 2012 by um, the Mayor of London, attracted over 7,000 people. Um, Here's a picture of the, the finished scheme. Um, I've cheated a little bit here with a picture of the river and the culvert with the before and after, but hopefully it demonstrates um, what we've managed to, to achieve. Um, since the park has been opened, we've noticed that visitor numbers have, have gone up dramatically. Um, we're attracting um, all ages to use the park. Um, young children love to play in, on the riverbanks, uh, as well as um, sort of families and, and uh, old people as well. We've managed to improve disabled access um, we've ensured that um, people on wheelchairs can, can use the park and get down to the river in some locations as well. Um, the park is really being used a lot by local schools. Um, teachers are, are bringing their school children along um, as part of educational visits to the park. Um, whilst I don't have any statistics to prove this, I'm sure that um, the park is also bringing about benefits in terms of health and, and, and well-being about people, the people that use it. A couple more images there of how the scheme now looks. And the Victorians were pleased to know that we did manage to restore their um, boating lake uh, in the end. No boating on it as yet, though, unfortunately. So just in terms of uh, a few summary points, um, I think one of the successes of this scheme has been uh, really sort of embracing the history of the park in the development of, it, of its restoration. So we've, we've tried to recreate the historic landscape by um, mimicking what was there previously. Um, Obviously, this, the River Wandle and Wandle Park has gone full circle. It's gone from being a, a problem, something that's very much been sort of tried to be hidden away and covered up through being culverted, into being a real focal point for um, urban regeneration. And the river is now the centrepiece of the park as, as opposed to being buried beneath the football pitches. Um, and the scheme has brought about real um, benefits to society and also uh, environmental benefits. Um, Whilst we're never going to get fish in this stretch of the river because it's quite uh, fragmented downstream with um, weirs and such like, we are noticing some benefits in terms of the macroinvertebrate communities that are using the river uh, and a contrib contribution towards WFD as well. And the future is bright for Wandle Park. Um, it's been nominated for um, the Landscape Institute Award, which is going to be awarded um, next month. And it's also been um, allocated the Queen Elizabeth II Field in Trust, which basically gives the park some additional protection from any future uh, redevelopment. Thank you.
<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, I hope at the end of the day you're still fit. I know it's a long day. My last presentation is dealing with the landscape architecture on the river Murin Graz, the capital of Styria, a southern province of Austria, neighboring Slovenia. Very briefly, a few words about me. My name is Hans-Jörg Raderbauer. I'm a managing director of a small landscape planning company. We employ about 20 people. I heard you have about 10,000 or 5,000. <laughs> so, uh, but our operation fields range from en environmental coordination for infrastructure projects, nature conservation, river development, and landscape architecture and reg regional development. This project I'm talking about now is one of the most important projects for me personally, and it's a very long-lasting project. Just want to give a short overview about what I will talk the next 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> After giving you information about the location, I will talk about visions we developed and how we tried to implement them with a long-term planning process during the last 15 years. My presentation will range from strategic planning and desi uh, to design and will show some examples. The river Mur is the main river in, in the province Styria, in the south of Austria. Graz is the capital of Styria and located in a basin after the river Mur has flown through the Alps. It's, it's a nice place. And Graz, Graz has about 260,000 inhabitants, the whole basin about 400,000. Graz is an old medieval city, and the river Mur is dividing the old town in two parts, so you can imagine that the river is, has major importance to the city. The existence of an utopia is necessary for its realization. And this sentence very often forms the basis for my actions. It helps me to pursue projects which matter to me with enthusiasm and persistence in the hope that one day being able to implement them. Today, I'm not only showing individual projects that we have carried out in our local environment, but also want to show how to pursue projects in the long term and hopefully manage to re realize them. I would like to show you the path from the vision to the implementation, from strategic planning through development planning all the way to the actual project. As we know, most of the urban river sections are highly developed. In, high, in highly developed countries have been heavily modified and Graz was not on the only city which did not pay much attention to the river development. But we started a big participation process with citizens of Graz and we developed some interesting visions and ideas for the River Moor. It was with all authorities and, and tried to involve a lot of people. And so it was our assignment to start in planning, uh, a planning and implementation <laughs> process together with the administration of the city and the region. We run through three different planning stages. The first was the strategy and zoning phase where we tried to find solutions for questions which, with long-lasting effects. And the second phase was the development and master plan phase where we carried out the necessity of space and budget questions and as well as we tried to clarify contradictory demands on the river. During the third phase, the design and implementation phase, we had our focus on architectural and landscape design questions, and we tried to find solutions for issues like river regulations versus the demand of the people to have something like natural experience at the river. Now I'd like to show you some examples for different planning stages, starting with the strategy and zoning phase. It was a very early project in our office, and we had to elaborate a long-term vision for the basin of Graz. The project helped us to get a clear picture of the potentials and possibilities, and this picture we can always install in every new planning pro process we are running through. I just want you to show a little bit about the preconditions in the city development, which should help you to understand the task. Graz, the capital of Syria, has undergone a dynamic transformation a comparison of old maps show the rapid expansion of the city center. In the, if the settlement develops 
co continues like like till now, we can say that in 2050 all the area will be merged together. Due to the systematic flood regulation in the second half of the 19th century, the water level of the Moor has slowed a lot. The Moor was also heavily polluted in the second half of the previous century and was regulated, uh, was regarded as, a, as the backyard of the city for the people of Graz. The town turned away from the river and its functional activities. The orig original connection between the river and the hinterland was interrupted and the economic and social life on the river was increasingly lost. The Moor had, so to speak, disappeared from the field of vision of the people of Graz and therefore not really usable as a leisure and recreation area for the local people. Today, the River Moor forms the ecological backbone of an agglomeration of settlements with about 400,000 people, I told you before. The moor has been cleared up regarding water quality and the town has recognized the importance of the living tree running through the center and wants to use the potential of this area for future development of the city. Utopias and visions help to convey a new spirit of optimism. To develop this, we try to work with pictures and discuss them in, in a focus group composed of people with different perspectives and of using and developing the river. The result was, for example, the city beach. The aim was the reversal of the backyard situation through the development of a waterfront. We, hear, we heard about a lot of this in the, in the keynote presentation. And act attractive op op Opinions for accessing the river and the creation of new leisure and recreation areas along the moor. Through this, in the future, the river will not be regarded as the city's backyard. The city will orientate itself towards the river, with, which then plays an essential role as a design element in urban planning. In the city center, we had uh, the vision here was to connect important city center places on the moor through channeling the traffic in underground and improving the access to the moor through enlarging existing and creating new cycle tracks and footpaths along the banks of the river. This, without doubt, very expensive project offers a long term but very important possibility of increasing life quality in the city center. In this way, a direct connection between city and river can be developed and enables space for high quality design solutions. We had to decide if the city should develop to the river or vice versa, and we suggested for the city center that a running river is crucial for the river experience in this area. Therefore, also no hydroelectric power plant should be realized, they want to, which affects the city center section. For the suburbs and outskirts of Scratch, we had a different idea. In the opposite to the city center, we thought that raising the water by realizing power plants would be a chance for these partly underdeveloped areas and could help to establish new recreation areas for the whole city. So at the end of this process, we had a zoning plan with visions and pictures for each section, and we created an instrument for communication to citizens, administration, and the politicians. And to resume this strategy and zoning, we have to say that's a long-term strategy. We heard about this today. We have to aim the impossible to reach the possible. We have to work with clear images and messages. And last but not least, we have to wait patiently for the window of opportunity, projects which open chances for development. This waiting and uh, patiently waiting, this is really for river restoration projects crucial. The next phase was the development master plan phase. Visions and utopias from strategic, strategic plans often run the risk of being left in drawers and on shelves. The step from the vision to the concrete planning process is very difficult because from this moment onwards, images will not longer be generated in people's mind. Instead, concrete plans and ideas must be brought to paper. In our case, the Moore Master Plan projects represent the step from the vision to the concrete implementation. 
Here, the window of opportunity has been opened through a large-scale project, giving us the chance to deploy synergy effects and define the demand for properties, money and time, and also negotiate the responsibilities between all partners. Furthermore, it was crucial for the success of the project to convince the citizens and politicians by, perf by perfect processing ideas. We had the opportunity to elaborate two different master plans for the river in the city of Graz. The first was the master plan Moor Graz House, where we developed ideas for different recreation areas. For example, here the uh, so-called Auwiesen, uh, an area for recreation and nature experience near this, in, in the city near uh, a large riparian <coughs> forest. Here in an overview, you can see the conceptual design for one section of the master plan. In the, in the suburbs of Graz, design co concepts were elaborated for the different zones, and basic design and utilization principles were developed for each zone. The harbor area was intensively designed in order to serve a center of attraction for water sports, for example. A second project, also located in the suburb of Graz, was the master plan Moor Center. The project has relevant effects we can notice along most of the city sections. Based on a big participation process with all relevant stakeholders of the city government, we had to negotiate and represent the interests of the city Graz within the context of the planning of a new hydroelectric power plant. We defined different design focus points which should improve the green corridor of the city of Graz. Some examples. <coughs> the design focus in the city center here is the, the idea of the implementing a traffic reduced zone to develop the direct contact between the city squares uh, and the river. A second very big design focus point will be around a cultural center in an old soap factory. And the third one uh, will arise along the area of the power plant station where mitigation measures will be combined with nature experience and observation along the fish, fish passage. This is one of the renderings of, of the project. And in the planning phase, tragedy and zoning, we suggested an area of ecology and recreation for the north of Graz. The hydroelectric power station will have some negative effects on the ecology, so we try to develop a huge river bed widening project in the areas connected to the hydro hydroelectric power plant. This would be a real interesting project with big potentials. We are now negotiating with the authorities about the implementation. Summarizing this phase of master plans, we have to seize the planning opportunities which are often opened by big projects. We have to bring together all re relevant stakeholders and also balance their interests. And planning requirements are often changing, so we have to respond fast and flexible to develop feasible solutions. Last not least, the planning phase, we are waiting for the design and implementation phase, but it isn't so easy. There are many players involved, therefore also many opinions, bit few clear decisions and mostly too little money. But get done is most beautiful. So I can show you some projects. First of all, again, the Auwiesen, which I showed you before. It is located on a new distributory of the River Moor, constructed as part of the hydroelectric power plant in the south of Graz. It's a huge nature-based recreation area, which gives the people living in the city the opportunity to have some nature experience. There are huge lawns with wooden decks. We have some barbecue areas and sitting areas. We have wooden decks for, for nature uh, observation near the water, some natural playgrounds for children, and last not least, uh, an information and sanitary area to, for, the, for the people. The second 
project uh, is the, the realized Moor Ufer Promenade, I showed you before in the, in the master plan. The project was very complex to realize because, of the design, because the designing had to be combined with the construction of a new, very big technical project, the main collection train. This train pipe was realized in the embankment of, of, of the River Moor and gave us the opportunity for this project. At least we designed a new, intensively designed area, wooden decks for to, for, to give guests to, to lounge and sit and sandbars and linger. We have a harbor, which will be the main hub for activity for young people and water sports. A rowing club now is established there, while pubs and restaurant ships hopefully, hopefully will follow. This is from the night picture. The less intensively designed Moor sidewalk is intended to be a place of recreation and retreat for the local people. The riverbank is designed semi-natural way and access to the water is realized. Here, safety regulations always have been an issue, but after long discussions, handrails and other fall protection devices could be avoided. Meanwhile, the project is well accepted, is a well accepted recreation area in a less developed part of the town. Last night, it's summarizing this phase. The quality of the project is depending on the precise details planning and ongoing implement implementation control. The function should determine the design. We have to plan for people which will use this area, not for architecture magazines. We have to respect the safety regulations, but we should try to give the people opportunity for river experience. And anyway, our main focus is to establish the river as a center of city life for leisure, use, and for spending time and moving along the river. Thank you. <laughs>